Good morning. Welcome to Andrews United Methodist Church Online. My name is Robbie Morris, and I'm the Director of Family Ministry and Facilities Coordinator here at the church. It is Sunday, October the 11th, and um, uh, we just wanted to thank you, first of all, for your donations over the last few months so that our ministries can can continue. Lots of stuff going on at the church and in the Family Life Center. Um, just have a few announcements about specific ministries. Number one, the second grade class that we sponsor at Andrews Elementary School, taught by Miss Forchetti, uh, really appreciates what we've given so far in cleaning supplies and Amazon cards so she can purchase sp uh, specifically um, recess bags. And that's basically a bag of toys and balls and things like that that the kids can play with. Uh, if you don't know, uh, because of COVID, they can't share toys and things right now, so they're doing individual recess bags for each student. Ms. Forchetti has four new students right now, and so she's in need of some some more, some some more, some more. <laughs> sounds like I'm saying s'mores. I'm making you hungry. Sorry. So uh, she needs some more supplies uh, for those recess bags. So if you could bring those um, Amazon cards by, we'd really appreciate that. I know that they would as well. Also, another ministry that we do is called Gabriel's Meal, and it's for Gabriel Mason's continuing medical care. He has closed syndrome, and we appreciate all the donations that you've been given over the last few months, but just wanted to send out a reminder to you about that. Also, Welcome Table goes on each week uh, on Thursdays. It is our community meal. It's free. And right now we're doing takeout and delivery. Uh, we used to, before COVID, we used to have the, our meal here in our Family Life Center, but we're unable to do that right now. If you're interested in helping out, we could sure use some help in the kitchen and handing out meals and so forth. Uh, just let us know. Get in touch with us, and uh, we'd love to have you. So really appreciate that. Appreciate those who have been helping helping out so far. Also, uh, we have an annual charge conference coming up. We're not sure yet whether it's going to be live or it's going to be online, but that is scheduled for November the 8th, 2020, and Pastor Tom will be presiding over that. The sanctuary is open on Thursdays for uh, individual prayer and meditation. We just ask that you observe the um, proper medical uh, protocols by wearing a mask, keeping minimum safe distance, and making sure there's no more than 10 people in the sanctuary at a time. So it's almost that time of year. It's hard to believe we we're already talking about Christmas, but, you know, we usually do this time of year. Anyway, uh, I'm always ready for Christmas. Operation Christmas Child, we all know about it. We participated last year by uh, putting together 36 boxes uh, that look just like this right here. And uh, we've got 36 more for this year that we're going to put items in. And I've been sending out emails and posting on Facebook a list of those items that you can get. And you can, of course, buy those and drop those off at the church uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 12. Uh, and if that doesn't work for you, just contact me, text message me, and I can set up another time for you to drop those off. If you're unable to go to the store or, you know, right now because of COVID, uh, you can order those items online and have it shipped to the church, P.O. Box 1310, Andrews, North Carolina, 28901 uh, as well. So I uh, just wanted to let you know that and give those options uh, to you. Or, of course, you can designate in your giving, uh, weekly giving or monthly giving, um, a specific amount that goes towards Operation Christmas Child and we'll go pick up some of those items. So got several ways that you can do that. Also, just wanted to, uh, for those of you who may be new and watching us for the first time, there's several ways that you can get information about our church. Number one is the website, andrewsumc.org. And um, we send out a weekly newsletter uh, by mail, as well as sending out weekly emails. And you can get on the email list and the mailing list for those things. Uh, we're also on Facebook, so you can get information there. I send out a weekly family ministry newsletter and it's, that has resources for parents and for kids, Bible studies and videos and things like that that folks can do at home since we're not able to do those ministries in person right now. Hoping that we'll be able to do that soon. So continue to be praying about that, that we'll be able to get back to normal. All right, uh, we miss you guys very much, and we uh, think about you all the time. Uh, if you have any prayer requests or things like that, uh, just want to tell us what's going on, please uh, let us know. Send us an email or a text message or something like that, or give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. So just remember this morning that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. God bless.
worship service uh, as we begin to focus and center ourselves for worshiping let's do so by uh, joining in a prayer we'll do this prayer as a morning prayer also a prayer for those in our congregation our community who are, are struggling and a prayer of confession so if you would join me as we seek God's face in the midst of this time of worship let us pray Ever-present God, you never leave us. Help us stay with you when we are tempted to flee and keep us seeking after that which is true, that all may know that you are the Lord our God, a tenacious presence in whatever our reality. Holy One, we are thankful for your presence and celebrate your grace which hears our petitions and responds with healing to our brokenness. With that in mind, we offer up to you our prayers for those in our community of faith and our larger community who are struggling with diseases of body, mind, spirit, and emotions. We pray, gracious God, that your healing presence would indeed be revealed to them and that you might heal the brokenness uh, in, in all of their lives and all of our lives. Knowing that you are a healer, that you seek to reconcile us constantly through the cross and resurrection of the Christ, we come to you with what limited trust we have as we offer our confessions to you. We acknowledge that you are the Lord our God, acknowledging that you brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We acknowledge that, we profess that, and yet our trust in you is fragile. Our trust is easily crushed by our bent toward indifference, easily crushed by our dismissal of your faithfulness as a result of our forgetfulness. Our trust is fragile. It's easily broken by the slightest pause, an answer to prayer not instantly given, request for peace not immediately felt. Lord, our trust is fragile, easily displaced by gods of our own making, the God of self-sufficiency chased at any cost, the God of illusion pursued in any form. Have mercy on us, Lord, through Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you have statues at home? That's a weird question, right? I'm sure all of us have some kind of statue. Maybe you've got a, a gnome in the garden out in front of the house or whatever. Uh, but um, 
in our house, uh, we have little things, little trinkets, collectibles. For kids, you, you might have an action figure, and you may have a trophy. And I know this isn't exactly um, like a statue. We, we think of, of people, and we think of people posed in a position like the Statue of Liberty, okay? And all the statues that we have all over the country, we think about Mount Rushmore and things like that. So these are kind of cool things that help us remember uh, special events and history and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I have uh, one of my baseball trophies from, this is actually when I coached, and I used to have a lot of sports trophies, uh, soccer trophies and football and baseball and things like that, and you had the baseball player on the top of the trophy in a pose, you know, it's kind of like in a picture, all right? So, anyway, a lot of us have those statues. How many of you remember playing a game called Freeze Tag? Okay, and I don't I can't remember the specifics, but everybody's running around, and you have somebody that calls out "freeze," and everybody's running, and running, and then they have to stop in a pose, and everybody picks out a pose. Madonna used to have a song called "Vogue," and you used to dance, and then you'd stop and and Vogue. I'm sorry, I danced there. Anyway, so our story from the Bible today, because we've been talking about Moses for the last few weeks, and um, God had done all this incredible stuff. For the Israelites, right? He took them out of Egypt, took them out of slavery. Uh, they, he actually parted the Red Sea so they could cross on dry land. He took them across the desert, gave them, we talked about that God gave them manna and food from heaven. So God did all these miraculous signs and incredible things, all right? You see, you'd think that we as human beings, when we see God do stuff like that, we'd be like, Lord, I, I, I love you and I thank you and, I, and I'm not going to worship anything else, you and you alone. Now, we just talked about the Ten Commandments and the Israelites had just gotten these Ten Commandments uh, from Moses when he went up on the mountain, talked to God, came down and had this tablet with these Ten Commandments on it or rules, uh, ways that we needed to live by, okay? And the first one, the first rule is you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or above heaven or the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. So he makes it pretty clear that he's number one, okay? That we're not supposed to worship anything else. So you think that we get that message and the Israelites would got that message and especially after God did all these incredible things. But what did they do? Moses goes off on to the mountain again to talk to God and he's gone for a while and, and the Israelites start kind of getting bored. And so they decide, Hey, Aaron, you know, Aaron's Moses's brother and he's kind of the leader while Moses is gone. He's kind of in charge. So uh, they go to Aaron and they're like, hey, will you take some gold and make a golden calf, a statue or an idol out of that so we can bow down and worship it? <laughs> Sounds kind of crazy, right? Why would we worship a statue? I mean, you get a trophy, a soccer trophy and you, you bow down to it. Oh, soccer trophy, I love you. Okay, so anyway, you get the idea. But they totally forgot about this commandment that the Lord said, hey, I'm number one. You don't worship anything else but me, okay? I'm first. But they go ahead and do this, and they build this golden calf, and they bow down and worship, and they have this big celebration and all this kind of stuff. And Moses comes back down from the mountain, okay, and catches them doing this. And God's not happy at all about that turns out that there's a great earthquake and it swallows up thousands of people, okay? So, anyway, God wants us to worship him and worship him only. Now, we wouldn't we wouldn't take a soccer trophy or, or a statue or the gnome out in the front yard and we wouldn't bow down to worship that, right? That'd be kind of ridiculous. But the, it's not just statues and things like that that God's talking about. God's talking about anything in our lives that comes before him. And that can be money, fame, popularity, sports. It's kind of whatever we spend most of our time doing or thinking about. I'm not saying that you're worshiping something, but we have to be careful. Because God wants first place in our lives. God wants to be everything to us. After all, he's done everything for us. Given us salvation and rescued us. From slavery to sin. So, 
this morning as we think about that. Uh, just think about some things, and I have to think about things in my life, you know, things in my life that I put before God. One of those things is, is music, and of course music is not a big part of my life anymore, but there were times when I spent an incredible amount of time on music. So, anyway, let's just remember and pray uh, this morning that the Lord will help us to worship Him and worship Him only. Dear God, let us always remember that you created us and all we have. Uh, you must always have first place in our lives. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you've done for us and throughout history to display your glory. We worship you and praise you for all that you are. In your name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
Oftentimes we're just, we're looking for some clarity. I, I don't know about you, but more times than not, when I open the text, I find it difficult to engage, at least to get beyond the esoterics of it into the depth of it. So I find it difficult to hear many times, so discerning what the writer is saying or trying to get across to us about how we should allow this living gospel into our lives and how we might recognize through what we read the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in our midst. For me at least, so often to be granted such recognition means that I have to let go of the sacred cows of what I think I know or what I have gleaned over the past and allow God to speak to me and perhaps to you as well today. So the gospel text that we just read from Matthew's gospel is one of the more difficult passages of Scripture that we wrestle with. For if we take it in its most common allegorical interpretation that the wedding feast is an eschatological or an end times banquet and that the king is God who has the divine prerogative to punish anyone who is unworthy for the kingdom, then we are forced to acknowledge a violent and vengeful God which stands in contradiction to the God whom Jesus speaks and the God whom Jesus incarnates. A God that is not only violent and vengeful, but also exclusive and elite, choosing who is worthy to enter the feast. Questions. Is God like a king who, when resisted and ignored, brings about violent and destructive events to teach a lesson so that others who might be on the outside looking in will not know to mess with God? Or is God an elite and excluding being who demands that everyone adhere to the same dress code or the same way of believing, if you will, lest they be tossed into the darkness never to see the glory of God's face? Or as I believe we see in Jesus, is God indeed one who opens the feast table for all to gather around and feast on the sumptuous, delicious, satisfying food and rapturous joy of dancing and celebrating in the company of the King of creation. Having said all that, I'm going to draw on the thinking the exegesis of theologian Marianne Blinkenstaff as I offer an alternative look at this parable looking at it from the perspective of those original hearers, trying to keep in mind the context within which the parable was told. Perhaps you'll remember that in Jesus' day, the Roman Empire controlled everything. And everyone's actions were to be responsive in a manner that was acceptable to Roman social dynamics and culture. The population of Roman Palestine, where Jesus lived and taught, were sacred to the empire's power or were scared of the empire's power and reach. And only the foolhardy or activist-minded dared to cross swords with imperial, imperial might or law. This is the world in which Jesus was born. This is the world in which Jesus taught the people of God and a kingdom which was diametrically opposed to that which they endured. Jesus brought something new to the table of life in Roman Palestine and to life even up to our point in time. This reading regards the king of the parable as being aligned with the powers of this world. The reading that is our typical allegorical reading regards the king of the parable as being aligned to the powers of this world which suppose the kingdom of heaven. So with that in mind, with all of that background knowledge in mind, let's consider what Jesus is saying as he tells the parable of resistance of the worldly power which was destroying what God had created in the beginning. Jesus begins His parable 
with the familiar, the kingdom of heaven may be like. It's a comparative qualifier. If we read the parable as Matthew has recorded it, the grammatical structure of the sentence standing as written, then what we encounter is a petty, angry, punitive, and despotic king or God who, when he doesn't get his way, wreaks havoc on those who have chosen not to play according to his rules. So much for a caring and loving God. But if we read this text as a warning to be on guard against that which would cause us to compromise our faith by acquiescing to social convention and what I would term as the feast of the status quo, then we encounter what it means to follow Jesus in the face of opposing worldviews. That said, Jesus or following Jesus requires that we are familiar with the way of the cross, a cruciform life, that we live it out and not just parrot someone else's interpretation of the Christian life in our response. It's important to know as we hear throughout the whole of Scripture, it's important to know the voice of the shepherd who calls us to the feast and to not be lured by the siren song of that which sounds familiar. As Blinkenstaff notes, those who resisted the king's call knew this king to be a tyrant. And their resistance follows what has been for Matthew's gospel a pattern of resisting kings. She gives some examples. The Magi resisted Herod's request to report back to him. You'll remember that. You'll also remember that Joseph took his family to Egypt and out of Herod's reach as he sought to find this Christ child and destroy him. And of course, there's John the Baptist who denounced Herod's marriage at the cost of his head. If we continue to read this in the context, we come to a troublesome point in which a man who appears to have been gathered with others appearing seemingly against their will to attend the feast. And he is subjugated to, to, to verbal abuse anyway to begin with by the king because of the way the man is dressed. The king in this story displays atypical behavior according to the customs of hospitality of that day. According to that day's hospitality, the host of an elaborate feast would protect and provide for his guests, including providing appropriate garments for those who attend the feast. So the king's behavior against this garmentless man draws our attention to consider the attitude of the wealthy and powerful, and perhaps our own attitude toward the poor. That the gospel says one should not worry about what to wear and that God will provide suggests rather strongly that this king is not God and does not provide as the scriptures assure that God provides. Following Mary and Blinkenstaff's suggestion, this garmentless man who is in most allegorical interpretations considered to be unfaithful because is not being concerned about his garment, is in fact the more faithful of those gathered. Think about it. The more faithful of those gathered because he is indeed following the advice of Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount to not be concerned with what you wear. His eyes and behavior are focused not on, earthly, on an earthly king's expectations but instead on kingdom priorities. Still the garmentless man is bound and cast into the outer darkness or onto the margins of society. Perhaps that's food for thought for you and me today concerning how the poor are treated in our society. So what are we to take from this contextual reading as opposed to an allegorical reading of this Parable and how are we to apply it to our lives? Scripture is meant 
to make us think outside the box of what we assume we know or what we've been told. I know you've heard this, but it's so very true. Scripture is also meant to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. This is where it gets really uncomfortable for me because every time I open the text, I am afflicted. I'm afflicted. But the grace of God also comforts me by reminding me that no matter the egregious nature of my sin, no matter the, the brokenness or the, 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 the turning my back on the grace of God and the love of God that has been given to me, that God continues to provide that feast which requires nothing of merit from me. I don't have to dress the right way. I don't necessarily have to express my belief structure the same way or, or the way others expect me to express it. I don't have to be of the elite in society. I don't have to believe as any one group or church or king might demand. But it's interesting to me in reading this text from the point of view that is behind the story is the notion of hearing the call of God and responding accordingly. Jesus says something rather cryptic at the end of, of the parable. Many are called, few are chosen. The call of God is given to all of humanity. Forgiveness is given to all of humanity. The cross of Christ, the resurrection of Christ was a gift to the whole of humanity. No matter what you might be told, God's salvation is universal. It's given to all. Perhaps Jesus is saying, few are chosen because many of us don't discern the call of God. We don't pay attention to, to the love of God that's poured out to us. Instead, we are fooled by the siren song of what sounds like God's call. The downside, of course, is that if we answer the wrong call, we get the wrong connection. The call to the wedding feast is a specific call to life, to a feast that has no end. If we were all together, I would say, let's get up and stomp our feet and shout. That's good news. The call of God invites us to a feast, to, to, a, to, a, to a wedding feast that has no end. And there's a way to continually hear this call, to hear it with clarity, to know the voice of the one who is calling. And it requires a little work on our part because it requires that we Engage God in conversation. We call that prayer. However you engage God in conversation. To meditate on the things that we read and, and sense around us that God is showing to us. It's important that we read Scripture. And it's important that we gather when we can in community to have the conversations as we seek to discern the proper call to the proper feast something to think on as we move forward in our lives. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks that you provide for us a feast that has no end, that you continue to reach out and call us through your provenient grace into the wedding feast. Call us to the table to feed us from the depths of your love. Help us, gracious God, to distinguish between the call of your loving grace and the siren stop song of a, of a society that would tell us we are listening to the wrong voice. Help us hear clearly, gracious God, and respond appropriately. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reflective hymn is Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. As we hear the music, perhaps we can ruminate, think about what the scripture is trying to say to us in our own lives.
receive this benediction. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guide your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.